Theme music, please. Aloha, everybody. Welcome to On Hawaiian Time. I'm Mick Kelber. I'm Bruce Omari. And you are... On On Hawaiian Hawaiian Time. Time. Aloha. Welcome to another episode of On Hawaiian Time. This week, we have our illustrious producer... Tim Coakley as our guest. Yay! <laughs> Excellent. Oh boy. Excellent. We're, we're, gonna, we're, we're trying to build the audience or kill the audience? <laughs> <laughs> Either way. Tim, Tim is a reluctant participant in this episode, but we're forcing him. I uh, usually like to be behind the scenes, so <laughs> just in hey, general. Hey, hey, wait a minute. It's his fault. If he didn't do this, if he didn't start this whole thing, we wouldn't even be here. You know, we got exactly. a lot to thank Tim for. A lot to thank yeah. Tim for. Or blame yeah. him for one way or the other. Yeah, either way. Yeah. So um, this week we're going to find out about uh, Tim and his background and what makes him tick. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> right now we'll do our segment called Around the Zoom. And let's find out. Um, what's been occupying us, maybe food-wise? I have to start with, it's avocado season. Boy, is it ever. So it's mm, yes. avocados for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yep. And I still don't get tired of them. We've got about four or five uh, varieties just in our area. Mick has his nice. avocado patch. Yep, which is just about done. But. Yeah, he pulls over to the side coming down. I won't say what street because he doesn't want anyone else to know about it. And he <laughs> hikes in and there are always about, what, about well, a half it, dozen? Yeah, I usually get at least two, but a lot of times four to six when it's really happening. And either somebody has discovered the patch. It's on an empty piece of property. It's on an empty lot. But somebody else has either discovered the patch or the season is over. I think the season is at least winding down, if not over. So, but so, yeah, I probably pulled probably four dozen avos out of that place, at least that many. So it's avocado. <laughs> That's uh, uh, something with avocado on at every meal. So, yeah, that and what? and I my wife is brilliant cooking, and she just made yellow curry, yellow vegetarian curry. And she did something with the tofu that didn't even taste like tofu. It was fantastic. So I'm a real yellow uh, curry fan, and she's she's um, into my wheelhouse now. So we're right there. That was his request (laughs) for his birthday. Yep. Mick just had a birthday. Yay! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Still alive! Yay! (laughs) Thanks, guys. Cheryl just bought me a new grill. My other grill kind of fell apart, so... Bruce makes great peppers. Tell them about your peppers, Bruce. (laughs) Shishito peppers. Yeah. Yeah. I love them. Yeah. It's this uh, mildly... I mean, so they say, you know, it's a mildly uh, spicy pepper. One in ten is like the devil's child. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like playing Russian roulette with peppers, but I love um, throwing it onto a, a real hot cast iron pan and just getting that thing nice and black, you know, really quickly. And um, yeah, just eating that and uh, just sprinkle it with salt and pepper. And you can even, you know, uh, grate uh, Parmesan cheese or something on it, but um, and that and beer go together <laughs> so well. <laughs> and you oh, wouldn't man. be watching a football game at the same time, would you? Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make it a Broncos football game. Yeah, <laughs> you go. go pass. <laughs> go pass. Uh, we've been spending a little more time on the breakfast meal. Mm. Uh, getting up a little earlier. Avocado and toast has been on the menu, but... Huevos Rancheros is one of the favorites mm. go to. Mm. Beans, uh, eggs, uh, a little hot sauce. Um, yeah, yummy. I think it's time to hear about Osmo. Does anybody know that <laughs> word, Osmo? Are you putting me in the hot seat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been waiting to say that. Tim, you're in the hot seat this oh. week. Hey. 
butt was getting a little warm over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Tim, we all know that you're from Connecticut. Um, tell us a little bit about your childhood there. What was it like? Childhood in Connecticut. Um, it was cold, <laughs> at least in the winter, at least nine months out of the year, it felt cold. No, uh, Connecticut, I, I had a great childhood growing up there. Um, I actually loved winter sports as a kid, as, as someone who's now pushing 50, I'm not so crazy about winter and that's why I'm <laughs> sort of why I'm in Hawaii right now. Um, but yeah, I grew up with, um, of course, mom and dad and five older sisters. I'm the youngest of six. So every morning waking up during the school year was like being at an airport. All of the, the hair dryers going in the morning from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. <laughs> I woke up hilarious. to that many for many years of my life. Oh, I man. woke up to hair dryers for hours and hours because I was the last one to go in the use the shower because, you know, I was the youngest and started school later. But that was one of my first memories is the sound of hair dryers, blow dryers. Oh. So wait, you had five older sisters? Five older sisters, yep. Uh, you're the youngest and you're a boy. I'm so the youngest. Were you pampered? <laughs> you know, a lot of people ask me that question. Um, I was to some degree of the four oldest sisters. The fifth sister, Betsy, who's closest to me in age, beat the crap out of me for many years. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Well, <laughs> not, not, don't take it the wrong way. Not just in a sibling kind of way. You know, we, we uh -huh. went at it for several years and, um, it was like, you know, like Saturday morning, like one of us on each end of the couch watching cartoons and then somebody starts pushing their feet or pushing uh -huh. the blanket or kicking the other person. And then it turned out to an all out brawl. And then I'm running upstairs, <laughs> hiding in the bathroom, trying to lock myself in you know, and I just can still remember her digging her fingernails into my arms and she had long <laughs> fingernails. But one day I got a little bit bigger than her and I was able to fight back and we became great friends after that. <laughs> we hit it off after that, right, Bets? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but we all get along great now. Yeah. So as the youngest child, um, did your sisters kind of soften up your parents for you? Were they much more lenient toward your, um, yeah, you know, the answer is, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would say definitely so. Um, uh -huh. so my oldest sister, Kathy is a little over 14 years older than me. And then Erin, uh -huh. they're Irish twins. She's they're within a year of each other. Um, yeah, they, they obviously, uh, you know, I think when your oldest sibling is 14 years older than you, by the time you get into junior high school, high school and start going out and doing things, your parents are probably just like over it. They're like, I've been through this five <laughs> times already. Just do whatever you want. Don't get killed and don't get arrested. <laughs> I think that, you know, and not that all my sisters were, were hell, hell, hellions. Uh, is that a word? Hellions? It is now. Anyway. I so. <laughs> <laughs> Not that they were all out there raising hell, but, um, you know, I think they are out there having fun. And I think they uh -huh. probably kept my parents up at night, some of them, some, some nights. And so uh, I don't think I got into much trouble as a kid or uh -huh. as a teenager. I was kind of mellow, although I did get arrested the night before high school graduation with a bunch of friends and, uh, and then <laughs> crashed my dad's car the day before graduation. Oh, and so yeah. that was an eventful wow. couple of days. Dare I ask, what were you doing to get arrested, Tim? <laughs> well, I live in a town or part of the, the state that's known for growing tobacco. In fact, my first job when I was like 12 years old was picking tobacco uh, for cigar wrappers. Uh, tobacco Valley is what they call the area. And um, that area and um, I think the Carolinas are known for their tobacco growing and their cigar wrappers. And um, there's tobacco barns all over the, the town, these big red barns, and they, the sides open up so the tobacco can air out during the summer after it's picked and hung. And there's this, rep there's this tradition of everybody painting their names or initials on these tobacco barns around town, and it's sort of a rite of passage. You know, before you graduate, you go in at night, at midnight, with a gallon of paint. It's not spray paint for some reason. People do it with big old brushes. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, maybe it's cheaper. And they put their initials or their name on there, or they write Led Zeppelin on there, or Phil Collins, or weird stuff. <laughs> But uh, it was our turn to do it. So we grabbed a few gallons of white paint out of the garage and we, we had a couple beers, I must admit, the night before graduation. And we, this is after I crashed my dad's car, <laughs> um, put it in the garage and put the garage door down and hope nobody oh. would notice. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we did. We put our names on there. There was too many of us. We were too loud. Somebody across the street, a neighbor called the cops. We heard the cops come in gallons of paint went flying in the street. People ran in all different directions. And oh, I thought we all got away. We all went home and went to bed. And uh, about midnight, my mom's waking me up and she said, Timmy, Danfield police are here. Were you painting on a barn on Weymouth Road tonight? And I said, <laughs> uh, I, uh, maybe. I, I, I mean, I was there and there were people there and they were painting and they want to talk to you downstairs. I stumbled downstairs and the police officers sitting at the table drinking a coffee. I think my mom poured him and, <laughs> and uh, he says, were you painting on a barn tonight at approximately 1030 PM on Weymouth road? I said, Nope, I was not. And he whips out his flashlight and he's going up and down my hands and my arms. He says, what are those paint specks under your fingernails? And there were paint specks under my <laughs> fingernails. And I said, well, I was there. I was holding the paint, but I wasn't actually painting. I just held the paint can for my friends. He's like, I'm writing out a summons for your arrest. <laughs> oh, man. That was bad. And my so dad did, didn't find out for a couple months. Wow. It didn't, oh, really? actually, I was, it didn't actually say Tim Coakley across the barn. I only wrote TC. I mean, I got arrested <laughs> for writing TC. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought it's, you didn't write anything. You were just holding the paint can. Well, well truth came well, out later that I did write something. It's oh. leaving your phone number, too. That's really bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so about a month later, I had a court date, and I was putting a tie on in the morning, and my dad said, where are you going, getting all dressed up on a Tuesday morning in August? I said, well, I got a court date, and I explained why, and I think I saw steam coming out of his ears, and he <laughs> got the silent treatment, and he walked off, and uh, I don't know. As a kid, did, did you, were you fascinated with film, moving imagery, is that? Um, part of your uh, producer story? Um, you know, when I was like seven years old, my best friends across the street, Dan and Pat Boya, their mom, Jackie, um, had this little movie camera. And she was great about, you know, doing things with kids in the neighborhood and us and keeping us busy and out of trouble. <laughs> and uh, she said her and my sister Judy one summer decided to do like um, a movie with all the kids in the neighborhood. And they, cool. they kind of scripted something out and choreographed skits. And we spent the whole summer do shooting, filming this movie. We called it the summer of 77. Pretty original. <laughs> and, uh, and then we did it again in 79. And she had me dressed up as this, this villain. And I was... You know, our neighbor next door, you know, she was like the damsel in distress and I tied her to the trolley tracks and then my other friend saved her. You know, he was Superman and just silly skits, but <laughs> a lot of fun. But I kind of got interested in it then. I was like, oh, this is cool. Oh, so thanks to awesome. Jackie Boya, I got interested in this. And, you know, a few years later, I was playing around with our own home movie camera. And then in high school, my mom bought us a video camera and then it was a little more easy to shoot. You didn't have to develop it. And. I just uh -huh. I got hooked on it in high school and then through college. Good evening and welcome to UCTV News. I'm Tim Coakley. Once again, UConn in-state undergrads can expect to pay more money next fall. When did Andrea get into the picture? Oh, man. <laughs> We're going there. <laughs> <laughs> We're going there. Yeah, you wait, talked wait. to me about picking up girls in church, so I just wanted to find out. <laughs> if that's where you met Andrea. Yeah, and Andrea, who doesn't that. like attention, is going to love the fact that I'm going to tell this story. <laughs> so at least we don't have many followers or listeners. <laughs> viewers. We do now. They all want to hear this. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. All right. Well, I'll tell the story and Andrea will get final say over whether it gets edited in or out. <laughs> so uh, I met Andrea my freshman year at the University of Connecticut. Uh, we lived in the same dorm. I lived on the first floor. She lived on the fourth floor, Hartford Hall. And uh, for some reason, the guys on Hartford First started hanging out with the girls on Hartford Fourth. So we all became this sort of group that hung out and kind of partied together and went out together and 
we got all kind of hit it off. And to this day, we're all really still good friends. And um, I kind of had a crush on Andrea from the moment I met her. And um, we had a class together uh, on the other side of campus. It was a drama 101 class or something. And whatever. I was awkward, socially awkward. And I, <laughs> I probably tried to hit on her and it probably wasn't clear or it was just <laughs> creepy or something. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I chased her for most of well, several. She was a year older than me, a, a class before me. So I chased her for several years in college and nothing ever came of it. And um, we went our separate ways after college. She ended up going down to Mexico and teaching down there. I ended up working in Miami for a while and we kept in touch as friends. We were always good friends. And uh, see, I'm, I'm an editor, so I, sh I should be making a long story short here. <laughs> um, so Thanks, I moved back to Connecticut in 2003. She moved back as well. And she had been living in New York for a little while after Mexico. She moved back and she was living with her brother in Connecticut and she was in transition looking for a place to live. I was as well. And I knew she needed to commute into New York. And uh, I purposely searched for an apartment on the Metro North train line that would be very convenient <laughs> to walk to that train station and get into New York. <laughs> um, I didn't really let, let her in on that secret, but I ended up finding a great apartment and she was still living with her brother and we started hanging out a little bit more. And I said, Hey, you know what? You know, when, when you're done with your brother's apartment there, when the lease is up, maybe I got a two bedroom, you should just move in. We'll split the rent. It'll be great. She didn't really say much. <laughs> and then, uh, one night we met, she was coming back from New York. She stopped at the train stop at my town. We stopped and had a drink and we talked about the old times and this and that. And, I, I, I said something about how many times I tried to pick her up unsuccessfully. And she said, yeah, usually you were drunk and <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna say yes to go out with you because you're always drunk. And, you know, <laughs> I didn't think you were serious. And she said something Great. like, you know, would you, I wonder if you'd consider, you know, dating, you know, now or something. And then she kept talking and talking and talking. And I was really, and I was sort of in shock and 30 seconds went by and I said, wait, 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 rewind. What did you say about dating? Did you say dating? And she said, oh, yeah, well, maybe. And I said, oh, I don't know. I think that ship's passed. You know, I think, I think it's just good to be friends. I was totally BSing. <laughs> I was trying to play it cool. I was trying to play it slow. But then I, but what stuck with me was like, oh, wow, I never asked her out sober. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> and so uh, I went home and a day or two later, I called her up. I said, you want to come over and have a cup of tea? <laughs> and so she did. And we had a cup of tea and I asked her out. And it was really hard to do sober. <laughs> even, <laughs> even though I was chasing her for, for years and years. And she said, yeah, and we started dating. And, you know, a month later she moved in and that's it. Long story short. And awesome. now this weekend we'll have been married for 12 years. Wow. wow. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Congratulations. Thank you guys. Good move. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> You're going to have to bribe Andrea to let, let that one stay in the show. Oh, that's kind of stayed in. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah. I'm so glad to too. know it wasn't a Tinder hookup. So I'm, I'm glad it's that fact. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that I'm, wasn't I'm super lucky to have him. her. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Oh. Hey, so coming from Connecticut, um, you guys have uh, a lot of professional sports in that general area, right? So, um, yeah, I'm wearing the Hartford Whalers shirt, the former professional former professional hockey team from Connecticut who moved and became the Carolina huh? Hurricanes. I was a huge Whalers fan, and they were the only pro team in Connecticut for many years. Oh, but yeah, most of the teams are yeah. New York, Boston area. Yeah. So are you like a loyal Patriots fan? I mean, I guess we know that, but for our viewers. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my, my, my parents grew up in Worcester, Mass, and uh, our family is mostly from Massachusetts. So uh -huh. grew up a Red Sox fan, Patriots fan, Celtics fan, not a Bruins fan because I was a Hartford Whalers fan. Uh, but yeah, supported uh -huh. all the, the Massachusetts teams for the most part. Yeah, awesome. 
going to Fenway Park. My dad used to take us at least once a year. I mean, that was a treat. I mean, to go uh, to Fenway, it was always magical. Yeah. And it still is when you go there because that park has not oh, changed much over the decades, century, really. Um, and, you know, going to a Celtics game. And I went to Bruin games too. I mean, the, Boston, the old Boston Garden was amazing. I mean, mm. I think, Mick, we've talked about it a lot like Chicago, yeah. the old Chicago Stadium, just yeah. steep. You're, you're right above the floor or the ice when you're at a game. And uh, right. if you're in the upper section, all the cigarette smoke wafted up and you're choking up there. <laughs> but that's the way it was in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. It's and the a team, lot like Wrigley Field in that way. You know, just yeah. classic old park. This is kind of like a good segue into uh, what you do now because you're a producer, director for, um, for uh, ESPN. So did your love of sports kind of um, lead you into that field? Yeah, it did. I mean, it was a combination of things, but my first love was just the, the video camera and editing mm. and, and producing things. And it wasn't always sports. But then when I went to the University of Connecticut, I helped launch the student TV station. And one of the things we were, I wanted to do was do a sports show. Uh, and it was right about the time where the, the men's basketball team was getting really good and then the women's basketball team. So we were able to get two free press credentials for every men's and women's basketball game. And those are hard tickets to get. The women's uh, games, when I was a freshman, you could still get them. But shortly after that, they started selling out and becoming a powerhouse. So I got to sit on the baseline of almost every UConn men's and women's basketball oh, game, home game, for three or four years. And... That to me was like, that was worth the price of admission by itself. So yeah, I got hooked on the sports. We started covering all the sports at UConn and uh, ESPN was in our backyard, you know, and at the time, you know, mid nineties, it was still a relatively new network. It launched in 79. Um, and so I, yeah, I got as much as experience as I could at UConn uh, with the student TV station, sort of self-taught there. There was only one media class at the university. I was really, mm. I was a marketing major because was a safer major. But um, that media class, that one media class I took my last semester of my senior year, the, the professor said, hey, um, I just got a call from a friend who works for ESPN and their international network is growing and they want resumes. And if you want a reference, I'll give you a reference. I said, yeah. Wow. And uh, it was kind of right place at the right time, in the right area. That was their international um, division. Yeah. So did that involve a lot of travel? Uh, it didn't at first. Um, a lot of it was just, you know, Bristol, Connecticut. And, uh, you know, I started as a production assistant pretty low down the totem pole. And, uh, yeah, it was like a lot of late nights worked almost every single holiday, Christmas, Thanksgiving. Oh, I mean, you, really? you just had to, because everybody wanted that job. And at that time it was, you just did it. And um, you got used to it, um, but a lot of like late nights, early mornings, holidays, you know, working New Year's Day at 6 a.m. Oh, man. Um, I, luckily, my family was in Connecticut, so I could maybe like spend a couple hours of a holiday with them and then I'd be like, all right, I got to go to work. Because, you know, sports, Thanksgiving Day is the NFL, Christmas Day is the NBA, and those were the sports <laughs> I primarily worked on. Uh -huh. And then as I got you know, a few years under my belt and got some promotions, traveling started and there was quite a bit of traveling um, mm. at that point. And I have been fortunate to, to see a lot of the world through ESPN and they were really good to me and they still are good to me because I, I'm an ind independent producer and contractor and I do a lot of work with them still. And, um, you know, they've, they've been my primary client um, they after I was a full-timer. Where did they send you? You know, the, some of the best events I ever did was for them was working um, Grand Slam tennis. So over a three-year span, I went to the Australian Open, the French Open, which is called Roland Garros, everywhere nice. else in the world, yeah. Wimbledon, um, and the U.S. Open. And I mean, to, to be able to do the Grand Slam tennis tour every year for three, I don't know, three or four years, that was amazing. That oh, was my man. favorite. And then Super Bowls. Several Super Bowls I worked. Um, 
trying to think what else. The 99 uh, Major League Baseball All-Star Game, which was at Fenway Park, was mm-hmm. like, for me as a Red Sox fan, was one of my favorite. Um, and then, like the last four or five years, I've been fortunate to be doing internal videos for their technical team for their big events. So college football championship for the past four or five years. Again, the U.S. Open. Yeah, I've been really lucky to, to be able to go to a lot of these these major events in person. It doesn't feel like work most of the time. You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's not fun. It's, it's not like you're on vacation, but when you're doing what you love, it's kind of nice to be able to do that and get paid for it. Oh, that's great. You know, you mentioned um, like the Grand Slam, the tennis tournaments, you know, like the Wimbledon and French Open, Australian Open, U.S. Open. You know, being a tennis nut growing up, um, you know, those events in itself, I mean, they're all individually on my bucket list, you know, just to attend, um, to be to be present um, during a tournament like that. I mean, that must be so awesome, man. You know, but so you've you've done like the Grand Slam, the um, Super Bowls. I mean, uh, is there anything that you haven't done that is on your list that would make your, you know, complete your resume or, you know, your... That's your, a tough one. You know, for, for many years, it was the Olympics. I had never worked in Olympics, and uh, I got to work the Rio Olympics in 2016, and I got to cover uh, um, Usain Bolt and oh. like, be right there when we were interviewing him. And, wow. you know, that was amazing to see him run at his prime and just uh-huh. everybody else looked like they were, you know, in the minor leagues, you know, <laughs> if there was. If there's no such thing so for track fast. and field, right? Yeah. But. Yeah. yeah, it was never really close. I mean, he sometimes, but not, not really. Um, that was amazing to see. And I got to see Michael Phelps win some gold medals mm-hmm. there, which uh, was pretty amazing yeah. too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was sort of my bucket list, the Olympics. Honestly, uh-huh. like probably the Masters would be uh-huh. the one I haven't worked that I'd love to work. Yeah. Wow. But, you know, I'll tell you one event that I worked is the Ironman here on the Big Island. And that's where I met Mick. Mm-hmm. And, um, I would, that's right up there with the top events I've ever worked, you know, partly mm-hmm. because of where it is, but the effort and the talk about logistics, pulling off a logistical yeah. event, that's a huge one. Thousands of runners yeah. closing off streets and parts of the big Island. And, um, that's an amazing event. And that's why I'm here right now that the ESPN <laughs> and the Ironman and all of that led me here now. And. Yeah, I, I love that. And I did a, a cycling event for several years in Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago, um, which I got to put the crew together for that for ESPN's Caribbean Network. And that was a blast too. And one year, in fact, I finished that event seven days in Trinidad and Tobago and I got on a plane and I came directly to Hawaii for the Ironman. Oh. So like spending October in the Caribbean and Hawaii one year, like that was the highlight of, <laughs> of my career maybe. <laughs> awesome. I mean, is there any one story that, or, you know, situation that um, sticks out to you, you know? Um, it's, it's tough. You know, I, that's what I love about what I do. I love the storytelling and that um, it's not just sports. It's, it's with anyone. And, yeah, you know, since I've been spending more time out here with you guys and, and trying to tell your story and, um, <laughs> We're getting Not there. We're, <laughs> we're almost done with the documentary. No, there's a lot there, but I just love storytelling in general. And it doesn't matter if it's an athlete, if they're if they make millions of dollars a year, or if it's an amateur who doesn't make anything and is just doing it for the love of the sport, or it's somebody who's, you know, documenting volcanoes, or it doesn't matter. I love good stories, and that's that's what I liked doing. And it took me a while to realize that's what I liked about my job. I like mm-hmm. meeting people. I like being able to call someone up or send them an email and saying, Hey, I'm doing a story and I saw something about you and can we sit down for an hour and do an interview and, you know, do a story on you. And this person is a stranger and nowhere else can you get access to someone that's willing to sit down and do a one-on-one interview with you for an hour or so. And they share the most intimate parts of their life often and, 
things their family doesn't doesn't even know about them, you know? Mm. And I realize it's like to be able to use the camera in the interview sort of as a tool to get to know somebody, it's like it's something you don't get in everyday life. You don't mm. get to know somebody so quickly, so deeply in an hour normally. And it's mm. weird too because you interview so many people over the years. I've been doing this like 25 years. Um, often their connection feels a little deeper than yours because you have to move on to the next person or the next story. And, they, and for me, it doesn't, it never lessens the attachment, you know, I, I have with people and the bonds that I create, but it's just, it's, it's a little different because it's a job, but there still is a human connection. Okay. So, um, I got a couple of questions <laughs> to to finish up this section on passion. Hit me. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any funny celebrity stories? Um, boy, funny celebrity stories that I can tell. <laughs> and not be, and <laughs> or, not be sued. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you don't have to mention their name. You can tell me later on. But <laughs> how about wait wait wait? How about the famous photographer that dropped his phone into the lava and then the crater? Think, yeah, <laughs> Mr. Bruce Amori. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> He's never gonna to, live that I one had down. I laugh, Bruce, when he was talking about all these famous people, and then he mentioned volcano photographers. You know, and I went, Usain Bolt, uh, Mickey Mantle. Um, you know, the guys from the Celtics and Bruce O'Mori and Mick Calvert. What? Wait a minute. You know, what doesn't what doesn't fit there, right? Yeah. Funny. No, you know, I have total respect for these athletes and professional athletes, but I think everybody has a story, you know. And so, to me, it doesn't matter if 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 you make millions of dollars or you don't make anything. If you're if you're poor or you're rich, it's not about money. You know, it's about the person and it's about it's about them and their integrity and how they treat other people. And I often, you know, talking about stories and stuff, it's not a specific story, but I, I've interviewed lots of professional athletes over the last 25 years. And you get like 10 minutes to sit down with them. And a lot of them don't want to be there. It's after practice. They just want to get home, but they have to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of them don't treat you well. You know, they're just... Uh you, you're a, a necessary evil part of the job that they have to do these things. Um, but sometimes you get surprised, you know, and uh, in the, the mid nineties, Reggie Miller with the Pacers was on top of his game. The Knicks and the Pacers were having these epic playoff battles. Him mm -hmm. and Spike Lee were going at it. Spike Lee was a Knicks fan and he was, you know, taunting Reggie Miller at the, at the garden, at Madison square <laughs> garden. And it was a great rivalry. And I wasn't a Knicks fan, but I thought Reggie Miller was cocky and arrogant. And I wasn't a, a Reggie Miller fan. And I had to go out to Indianapolis and interview him. And I expected to get just treated kind of poorly by him. Uh -huh. And he sat down and he surprised me. I was nobody. I was a kid who, you know, maybe had been working for a few years in the business. And, uh, he gave me a great interview, nicest guy I ever met. Nothing like the persona you saw on the court, like there's a villain that he played up to the crowds. And he, he uh -huh. I think he relished that and he, it made him play better. But he was sweet, one of the sweetest guys, nicest guys I ever interviewed. It was supposed to be a 10 minute interview. When I was finished, he said, Do You have any more questions? I can hang around for a bit longer. I got nowhere to go. You know, it blew <laughs> wow. me away. Yeah. So, you know, that was. There, there's stories like that. Not there. Not everybody that I've interviewed, or not all these guys are arrogant millionaires. There's a lot of good guys out there. There's some on the arrogant side as well <laughs> that comes with the territory. You know those stories. Rudy Tomjanovich was another guy who was really great to me. One of the first interviews I ever did. Him and Charles Barkley when they were with the Rockets. You know, I was stuttering. I was nervous. I was shaking, holding the microphone, interviewing these guys. And they were like super nice to me. They knew I was new and they knew I was nervous and they gave uh -huh. me a pat on the back after and said, good job. And you know, those kinds of moments stay, stay with you and tells you a lot about somebody's character. I mean, Barkley yeah. always been a great, a great guy to be around mm -hmm. in terms of a media person being around him and uh -huh. you know, certain guys. I'll tell you one, one more quick story. Larry yeah. Bird, one of my idols was coaching the Indiana Pacers the same trip I was out to interview Reggie Miller and couldn't wait to interview Larry Bird. I didn't have a one-on-one, -on -one, but I got to stick a microphone in to, you know, 
an interview with another 20 media guys when I got to get a question in. And uh, it was his first year as a coach. And I said, what's the difference between entering the playoffs as a coach as opposed to a player? And he said, well, then I was a player. Now I'm a coach. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> and I was devastated. And I said, oh. man. I was like, Do you, this guy has no idea how much I idolized him as a kid. And I got really mad and I, I was bitter about it for a while. Then I realized I loved him when I was a kid because he was kind of matter of fact with the media, even as a player. And uh -huh. he did kind of stick it to the media. And I didn't realize I was part of the media now. <laughs> so I got over it and I forgave him, but it was one of those aha uh, moments for me. Well, he actually, made a, he actually made a point there, Timmy. I mean, he was a player and he was a coach. And they're not the same thing, right? Yeah, and it was another one of these deals where he's 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 not big on doing interviews, you know. Yeah. He's, he just yeah. wants to go out there and coach or play and do his job, and I get it. Uh, that's like a, that's like a Bill Belichick answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, wow, great stories, man. You know, watching that Michael Jordan interview was like that, or the documentary was like that too. You, you could you could see the onslaught of reporters and photographers that were on him all the time, all the time, you know? And there yeah. were moments when he was rude to them and there were moments when he was human, you know? Sometimes he was a nice yeah. guy, sometimes he wasn't. But yeah. Say, you know, I, yeah, I mean, seeing how these guys have to deal with media day in and day out, I mean, I can't blame them for putting up these walls and how they treat media because if not i mean i think you'd be you know i mean i think they'd be empty on the inside you know yeah. having to give 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 yeah exactly, yeah it's, it's tricky it's a it's a, it's a yeah. balancing act for sure you know and you don't know yeah. what kind of day those guys have had and how many interviews they did before they got to you and yeah. you do have to give a little bit of a benefit of the doubt here and there yeah. um some and, of it is the way things I, are set up like they're told you've got to do it they don't have a choice so yeah Andy and i did yeah. an interview one time for espn with uh, magic johnson nicest guy mm -hmm. in the world and the guy that oh, really? was, doing, was doing the transmission completely blew it. And so he was sitting around, sitting around, sitting around, you know, waiting. And you'd think he would have gotten mad. He didn't get mad. He just hung. Oh, really? He was the nicest right. guy in the world. Yeah. You know, awesome. but, but your, your story reminds me of one time I was, I think I was in Denver, and they sent me down to a tennis tournament down, downtown. And, and I didn't know who the players were. It wasn't like John McEnroe and, you know, the top guys. It was, you know, some other guys. And they were well-known in to an extent, but I didn't know who they were. They sent me into the locker room to interview one of them. They told me who to interview, and I couldn't have, I didn't, wouldn't have known who he was if he hit me in the back of the head, you know? So we went, in, we went into the place, and I was kind of like, um, can you guys help me here? Who's uh, so-and-so? And they looked at me like, get the out of here, you know? And they, they didn't have time for that. And, and somebody jerked me around and sent me to the wrong guy. And, you know, it was like, oh, my God. Oh, and I felt like about two inches hollow, you know. It was awful. <laughs> but understandable. Yeah. Some idiot I mean, walks in, extent, doesn't even know who he's looking for, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to an extent, there's, you know, a level of professionalism that you also expect, you know, from these guys. Sure. And sometimes they go out of their way to make things difficult for you. And that is where I begin losing respect for some of those Yeah, guys. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, oh, awesome, Tim. Um, so do you have any embarrassing stories? Oh, like, like Mick said, I've gone up to the wrong person and thought they were someone else. Oh, really? And uh, did an interview at a, a professional golf tournament one year. And I'm a big golfer, but... Honestly, I hadn't been following the tour for a couple of years. I didn't really know who these guys were. And I was supposed to be interviewing Charles Schwartzel, South African oh. player. And uh, there was five or six players were going to come through for interviews, not just with me, but we were sharing the interviews with um, some other networks. So I wasn't interviewing everybody who sat down. So I had to look at the, the photos online, make sure I knew who was coming, if they were for me or someone else. So a German player sat down and he was... He was top 10 player at the time. Uh, Martin, 
See, I don't even know his name. Martin Raymer, maybe? Is that anyway? <laughs> it wasn't Charles Schwartzel who sat down. And I thought it was, and I jumped in the interviewer's seat and I said, so tell me what it was like growing up in South Africa. He said, I couldn't tell you. I grew up in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked around the room and I said, oh man, I said, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry. And then the person who was supposed to be interviewing this German golfer took the seat and oh. swiftly took the interview over and I went with my tail between my legs and <laughs> left the room. That's great. Oh, man. Oh. It happens. It, yeah. you, you know, you, you, you don't always specialize in a sport. You get thrown around. And you have to know sure. every sport. And, you know, I, I didn't know who this guy was at the time. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I was um, interested to hear your perspective regarding um, – you had you had met Mick during Iron Man, and you were starting to watch his weekly flyovers – and you contacted Mick regarding, you know, you had a project that might meet up, you know, go together and how, you know, this whole hot seat Hawaii started. Is this the part where we do the lava fix? Maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Have we yeah. already, we gotten past the takeaway, right? Yeah. And the takeaway is yeah. just, I don't know what the takeaway is. <laughs> and my, my other question, my other question was going to be, you know, People come to Hawaii and enjoy a good vacation, but you and Andrea both really had Hawaii kind of capture your heart. And I would love to, to know that process or hear about what you guys have, you know, felt and, and what you see in, in Hawaii and why it brings you back. You know, the, the Iron Man was the, the first experience we had with the Big Island. Andrea came out here with me too, doing that a couple of years. I had been to Oahu to visit a friend who was in the Air Force in 94, and that was great. And we did a Maui trip. And then in 2015, after Ironman, a couple of years doing Ironman, we did a couple of weeks in Maui and a couple of weeks in Kauai. We had a bad car accident and uh, I couldn't work. And we just figured, let's go check it out and, and see. We had a little bit of a life changing perspective after the accident that let's mm. kind of do what we want to do. And so we saw Kauai, we saw Maui, we loved it. And then, yeah, I was following Mick uh, and, and Bruce during the 2014 Lava Flow towards Pahoa. And I got more interested in what they were doing and seeing the weekly videos. And I started keeping in touch with Mick over Facebook. And um, we, we got on the phone a couple of times. And then finally, you know, I, I wanted to tell the story of what they were doing. And, and it was going to have nothing to do with the 2018 eruption because we started the project in 2017. I thought the story was interesting in 2017 and it got more interesting <laughs> in 2018. Um, but I think to answer your question, Anne, the, the reason that we keep coming back and now that we're living here full time is it's not just Hawaii. It, 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 it's getting to know you and Mick better and Bruce better and Cheryl and, and the people here we really connected and bonded with. And I think probably the 2018 eruption had something to do with that too. That was, that was an experience that um, I'll never forget. And it was so intense and we got, we saw the, the good and the bad in each other because we were so close together for so many days. Like we, <laughs> if I was in a cranky mood, unfortunately, you guys saw that. And <laughs> you guys had every reason to, you know, not be smiling and happy and go lucky every day because your house was in danger. And it was, it was tense times. It was emotional. And so I think we know each other pretty well, you know, over a short span of time. And that's kind of, I think, why we, we've come back because of our bond with not just the island, is it's the people on the island. It's yep. people like you guys. And, you know, we made great friends and Ohana. and You are family. You are Ohana. And it doesn't hurt that it's warm here in January and it's just below <laughs> zero in Connecticut in January. <laughs> uh, you well, know, you guys you, are you, definitely a part of our Ohana. You made Thanks. me uh, think for it, though, but we didn't really do the takeaway, but I do have a little takeaway, and I didn't have it till just now. And that's, um, it, this is a fire island. And, uh, you know, we've, we've noticed, those of us have been here for a while, we've noticed that when people come here, it, this island forces things to happen. And it, it, it's, it's, 
it like melds things. It, it you know, it's, it burns you up. A lot of people can't stay here. A lot of people leave, you know, but if whatever's going on in your life, uh, you can hide in the city. You can't hide out here. You know, whatever is going on in your life is going to come to the fore out here. And, you know, so it, it kind of, you, you know, you either people either connect out here or they run away. You know, and you, you've connected out here. You've found something out here. This is, this is um, at least for a while, this is your home. But, you know, yeah. you, you've, you've, you've made, it, made this place your own. And that's, that's the same thing that I did. Annie, of course, was born and raised here. So was Bruce. But for, for those, um, those of us that, that visit, visit here, some of us connect with it and some of us don't. For some of us, it's just a vacation place. For my parents, it was a vacation place. But for me, from the very first time I ever came here, I felt like I was home. And, and I you know, eventually just decided to move here. And so, and so did you. you know? So it's, it's interesting in that way. Yeah, I mean, for me and Andrea, Connecticut is always going to be home. That's where our family is, where we grew up. We have great friends there, um, lifelong friends. But also at, at a certain point in our lives, you know, over the past few years, things things got a little stagnant in terms of what we were doing. And so for us, and it's not for everybody, we, we wanted to shake things up and change and, and try to live in other places. You know, you're only on this this planet once and it's like, there's nothing wrong with Connecticut. We'll probably live there again someday, and and I love Connecticut, but I want to experience living in other places too. You know, um, I love meeting new people, and it's like to me, it's incomprehensible. Is that the right right word? I'm so bad with vocabulary, but sure. to to think that I would not have come out here and I would never have known you guys, mm-hmm. like to to think that you guys would not be in my life, you know, that's. I, w- I would feel robbed, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like when we make decisions to to explore and get out of our comfort zones and places where we live for a long time, you just never know what's going to happen and who you're going to meet. And I love meeting people from all over the place. And um, I don't know, but there's something about this island where it does feel like home here. You know, mm-hmm. it's very comfortable here. And the fact that the earth rattles and shakes randomly <laughs> like it did the other night. <laughs> and sometimes lava blows out of the ground. And sometimes there's tsunami warnings. Like I always thought I'd be scared of that kind of stuff. And I have been scared a little bit, <laughs> but it's, it's also like, it reminds you that you're alive and that the earth is alive. And it's like this, this Island is very much alive. You can feel the pulse of this Island. And so for, for me, it's like, I do feel a bit more alive here you know, than I have in other places. And it gets into your blood, bro. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. I may not always live here, but it'll always be home to me. Yeah. So last question. What was the most exciting, hair-raising, life-threatening <laughs> shoot mm. you've ever done? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an if, easy one. If that isn't a setup, I've never heard it. <laughs> that's an easy one. Well, they there was probably two, and they both took place in Leilani Estates or in Pahoa in 2018. <laughs> both involving lava and eruptions. Um, yeah. Although there was a bomb threat during one of the Super Bowls that I had to work through. but. Ooh. I don't think it was as scary as the lava bombs coming out of Fissure 17. <laughs> it definitely wasn't as scary. Uh, yeah, Fissure 17, when we brought Shane Victorino in to have a look, was one of the scariest moments of my life. Questioned what I was doing, trusting you guys, putting my trust in your hands. Um, the gases, the lava bombs, the explosions. Remembering my wife saying to me before, you know, I left for this, that trip. Just don't do anything stupid. <laughs> Remember, remembering those words like, oh man, I just, I'm doing something stupid, aren't I? It all ended well. The um, irony of the, the irony of it in a way, I never thought about this is here you are with Shane Victorino, a sports, yeah, well, a yeah. famous sports guy. From the Boston Red when, Sox. When you've covered, yeah, yeah, exactly. Isn't that funny? It is funny. And, you know, he, he was an integral, integral part of uh, helping them win a World Series in 2013. He had a grand slam in the, I think, the ALCS. And uh, yeah, he's 
he's a he's a star in Boston because of that. And uh, it was fun being out there with him. And, when and we he were, is one of those athletes who is down to earth and a nice right, guy. Right. And when yeah. and when the lava bombs were rolling off, his eyes were about this big around, man. He was, <laughs> so were mine, but he stuck around and I <laughs> bolted. I left a lot earlier knowing Mick was there with a camera getting everything we needed. There you go. And then a close second was when we had to drive out to Fissure 8 when the, it was high fountaining, two, 300 feet. And uh, I just couldn't believe we were going to try to drive over an active fault, an active crack, fissures, <laughs> fissure line to get there. Is, it, is this where we need to go to get the shot for real? You're safely being a one here, this wasn't that. Oh my god! Can you stop for a second? Oh my god! Holy sh! Can you stop for a second? No. Because I gotta get a new car in here. Okay, well, take it easy. Chill out. No big I deal, just, right, B? I almost, I almost bailed. I almost bailed on that one. <laughs> But I went, and by the time we got there, I calmed down because it was mesmerizing and hypnotizing when we got there. And I realized, okay, these guys do sort of know what they're doing. Like, <laughs> I got to give it to them. Sort of. <laughs> sort I proved of. it yeah, was we, only sort of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. That was great. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Mick. Thanks, Ann. Thank Absolutely. you. It was wonderful. Great. OHT.rocks. Go to yeah, OHT.rocks. Help us out. We're glad you moved here. We're glad you came I'm glad here to be in the here. first place. Absolutely. <laughs> Love you guys. Yeah. Take care. You're the man. Aloha. Take care. Aloha. Aloha.